We're up? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. How are we all doing today? You had a good show? Ready to go home yet? <laughs> yeah, that's usually the way it is on the last day. So my name is Chell Nymark. I, uh, I'm the training and certification manager for the National Wood Flooring Association, or the NWFA. So all things concerned with hardwood flooring is what we're in charge of. So we, in, we're, we represent the entire chain of hardwood flooring from manufacturing down to contracting. Um, so my role in that, in that department is in technical training and for certifications. And we certify everything from, from salespeople to installers to sand and finishers to uh, inspectors. And why do we need inspectors? Because quite often we have wood flooring failures and somebody needs to be able to, to gather the data and figure out why things happened, why things didn't go right. And the way we, we look at those is we apply them to the technical guidelines or standards, which the NWFA does right. So we've just actually completed this and put it to print. This is a whole rewrite of the old industry guidelines for hardwood installation. We've also got the sand and finish once that was completed a few years back. But uh, we're responsible for the industry standard for how to install wood flooring. What I want to go over a little bit today is common misconceptions and common mistakes made with engineered flooring products. So engineered has become very popular. Um, why, and why do you think that is? Why is it that we were going away from solid wood products and more into engineered wood products? Anybody care to guess? Pardon me, what was that? Less mess? Okay, so yeah, that's true. When it comes to pre-finish, most engineer products come with, uh, with finish already applied so you don't have to go through the mess of sanding and finishing. That's true. Uh, no, oh, pardon me? There you go. So the, I think the, the biggest reason that engineered has become so popular in the market is for its stability, its dimensional stability. I think most of us know that when wood gets wet, it tends to expand. And when it dries, it tends to contract or shrink. We call that a hygroscopic property of wood, as, a, as what wood is. That's what it does. When you engineer a product, what you do is you, through cross-ply construction, all that expansion doesn't just go in one direction or back over the width of the board. It's also dispersed through the length. So you have a lot of inner fighting going on with the core plies as opposed to the wear layer that keep it more dimensionally stable. Can anyone tell me how much more dimensionally stable it is in solid wood? There's no way to really actually calculate the difference. We just know that through that construction process, it will be. So the result of all of that is we're starting to see a lot wider widths we're starting to see a lot longer lengths to that process because, of its, because it's more dimensionally stable. But every product has limitations. And it's no different with engineered product versus solid. Solid, we know exactly how that's going to react. We can actually calculate the amount of expansion due to how much relative humidity increases in the room. We'll, we could actually predict exactly how much that board wants to expand or contract. With engineered, we don't have that. But as if you look at any of the installation guidelines that come with the product that you're purchasing, they will have a window stipulated in that box as to where the environment needs to be kept in order for that material to stay stable. When you go outside those parameters, the dimension is going to change. So it does have limitations. It has been kind of oversold in that people, when they, when they, when they hear the word engineer, wood flooring, that it's impervious to dimensional change. It's, I could put this anywhere and it'll survive. But it does have limitations. And when those limitations are exceeded, we have some flooring issues that we have to deal with. I have some samples here of, of, uh, of product that has been damaged. Some of it is through improper installation techniques. Some of it is due to manufacturing problems with manufacturing, 
and some of it has to do with environmental issues. Typically when we have problems with engineered, oddly enough, environment plays a role. I don't know where you guys are all coming from, but if we live out here in the desert, what kind of a climate do we have here? It's very arid, it's a very dry climate. If we live in Florida, what kind of a climate are we dealing with there? Very moist, it's a very damp environment. All of those are gonna to react to any wood product, not just wood flooring, any wood product is gonna expand or contract with the change in the environment. So it's very important to understand what the, what the limitations are of the product that you're selling in order to curb the expectation of the end user so they understand what their limitations are and not to exceed them. So let's take a look at what we have here. A common environmental issue that we run across with engineered wood products is typically in arid environments. It seems to manage quite well in damp environments, but when you get into arid environments, that's where you start to get some conflict or some, some inner struggles with the, with the material. And you'll end up with something that we call dry cupping. So what that, what's creating that effect is that the, the, the environment has become so arid that this wide piece of veneer that's on the top wants to shrink and the, bot, the core that it's adhered to wants to keep it from shrinking. So you get an inner struggle between the two. But the wear surface is typically a little bit thicker than the rest, and is typically of a more durable, like this will probably be a harder wood than what you're gonna get in the, in the core. So it's a little bit stronger. When it comes together, it pulls away from the deck and you'll end up with dry cupping. And the whole floor could look like it's all cupped out as a result of a dry environment as opposed to a wet one. We call that dry cupping. Now it could go to an extreme like it has in this, in this instance where th there's been so much tension from that wear surface pulling away from that core that it actually separated. Typically what you'll see is the separation will be between the, the top layer or the, what we call the wear surface and the core. That's typically where that bond failure is going to be. But quite often it could also just be the plywood that it's adhered to starts to come apart. The weakest link in that chain is where it's going to separate. In this case, it's the wear layer that's separating from the core. What do we call that when that happens? Is there a name for that? Have you heard the term delamination? Delamination is, there's, there's a, it's, it's kind of misused quite often. There's, there's two ways to look at delamination. Delamination refers to a bond line failure, or the glue line is where the failure happens and occurs. And when it does, it separates with a clean break where you're not gonna see a lot of wood fiber transfer. What we have here is we have, as you can see, a lot of wood fiber transfer. Between the two cores. So in other words, there's enough, there's enough tension there so that it has actually torn the wood fiber apart. And I'll pass this around so you can get a better look at it. So there's so much tension, it's actually pulling the wood apart. So is that a manufacturing issue when something like that happens? Absolutely not. The adhesive, the way it was manufactured, is performing the way it's supposed to perform. The wood is separated because the environment has not been kept in control. So you got into a, a, an arid environment and kept it there for a long time, long enough so that when that, that top layer wanted to shrink, it's pulling away it's the wood fiber that's, that it's adhered to. That's an environmental issue. Here we have another of the same type of an issue where you, it's been in, introduced to a, a dry environment and you have delamination, but in this case, there's no transfer of wood fiber between one to the next. So in other words, the adhesive's not doing its job. This is a manufacturing issue, and this can happen. It doesn't happen very often, but it does happen where in the, in the process of making this material, if it goes, if, let's say it's a hot press, if it goes into the hot press and it's not cooking up to the correct temperature, it doesn't get a chance to adhere properly. And a lot of times you're not gonna see that until you install it, and then just a slight change in the environment and it starts to shear off. If you see something like this coming out of the box as an installer, I don't know how many of you are installers in the room, but if you see anything like that coming out of the box, you have to phone the manufacturer right away and let them know because it's not just gonna happen to one or two boards, right? It's gonna be in 
everything in that box is probably going to have some kind of an issue. And it could be the entire pallet, could be the entire lift. The manufacturer wants to know if this is happening because it's not going to be just your job where this failure is going to occur. It's going to happen on multiple jobs. So they want to cease having that flooring installed. So if you ever come across something like that that you notice during installation, you have to call the manufacturer and let them know that this is happening. And I'll let you know, I'll pass this around as well. Other issues that we find um, with environment. So obviously that's, those are extreme cases where it's been exposed to a very arid environment enough so that it started to actually fail and come apart. Um, other minor issues, I call them minor, but as you all know, if you've ever dealt with customers, any issue is not a minor one. If it's an issue, it's an issue. And quite often what you'll find is you'll see checks or splits that occur. And that's basically the same thing. So the environment has changed so that the material wants to shrink up, but the core underneath it is trying to keep it from doing that. But it's going to find the weakest part of that board, and that's where you're going to see that split occur. So in this case, we call this a wind shake. And uh, a wind shake can occur from just a tree as it grows. If it's subjected to an area where there's a lot of wind, so the tree is racking back and forth, it creates weaknesses within the wood fiber that you won't see until you install it and the environment changes and all of a sudden it splits out. Quite often you'll see this in the box too. If you're pulling out and you're installing flooring, if you ever see a shake, same thing with solid wood flooring, if you ever see it, don't install it because you don't know how deep that shake is gonna go. If you have a solid piece of wood, it could go right down to the bottom and you won't be able to sand that or fix it. It's, gonna, it's, it's a, an issue that you have to separate right away. So in the, in the insta installation process, these are the things you're looking for. Not just the grading, but also if there's any, a potential for it to split. Because again, you'll get a call back and quite often, here you go, sir. And quite often, if it's a glued down product to concrete, have anyone done repairs on in engineered floors on concrete that have been glued down? Nightmarish, isn't it? You don't want to replace boards if you don't have to. So separate them while you're, if you see it, take it out. Again, this is more example of a, of a split. And these might seem like minor things, and you might be able to fill those with a, with a putty. But again, if you have a, an area where you're going to have fluctuation changes of uh, temperature and relative humidity, that filler might not always stay in there, or it might continue to split. So quite often, when you come across something like that, it's better just to remove the board or replace it if you have material to replace it with. I'm going to pass that around, too, so you can see this. These are very common issues that customers have post-installation that, yes, sir? Well, is, that was a good question. So the question is, is that a manufacturing issue? It is and it isn't. I mean, the natural process of drying out a tree, you're going to see splits. When you fell a tree in the woods and let it lay down for a while and look at the end, are you going to see splits? Any time wood fiber is going to shrink, there's going to be a weakness that's exposed. So manufacturers do try very diligently to try to remove material that has existing splits while producing the product, but they're not going to catch all of them. And quite often, if the, if the environment stays stable within the window that you're supposed to keep it in, those splits probably won't show up. So it's a, it's a combination of both manufacturing and environmental. The splits are always going to be in just every floor but they don't always get exposed unless the environment changes. So the answer to your question is, it is and it isn't. It is slightly, uh, there's, there's blame to be put in both directions. This is another example, a shake. And another, re another way that this occurs, and it's not just the, the wind that's creating that shake or that, that weakness in that wood fiber, but also just felling the tree, bruising the material, something bumps up against it. Anything that can cause a weakness in that wood fiber will show up. If you see it when, you, when you're taking it out of the box, don't install it. But if it shows up later, it's, it's unfortunate, but it's going to be a, a, a board replacement. 
fail. So those are, are most of our, what you'll see that are created through environmental changes within the, the building that it's installed in. So it's very important that to understand that engineered is not just, it's not impervious to dimensional change, it will change. So it's important to keep that environment in check and it's important to let your customers know where it needs to be in order to stay stable. So you don't get these issues because you don't want to have to keep coming back every year to do board replacements. So some other issues that you're going to find that are more installation related. Quite often we glue down uh, wood flooring to concrete. So what are the concerns that we have when we glue down the concrete? Moisture, that's a big one, right? We need to know what the moisture content is of the concrete before we start installing, because if we don't know, we're really just hoping for the best. So we have to do some moisture testing. What are common tests that you perform for concrete before installation? RH, yes. Quite common, what I find with a lot of contractors, they'll do a polyfilm test. So they'll just type down a piece of plastic down on the concrete and leave it for two days or three days and come back to see if any water has formed, any droplets of water, or if you, when you remove that poly, if it's a little darker in the area where you put the poly, what is that telling you? That's telling you that there's excessive moisture in the concrete, right? Because it's being trapped by that poly, so it just beads up on the bottom of that, that sheet of poly. That's telling you that there's excessive moisture in there, but it doesn't tell you how much it is in there. So it's a good initial test to perform to see if you have excessive moisture, because if you see that, that's telling you not to install. You cannot install at this point. Other tests that you can perform include um, calcium chloride tests, which is a, what we call a dome test. That is an actual quantitative measurement for how much vapor is being emitted from the concrete. So we, we do have formulas for that. So if it's at three pounds for 1,000 square feet over a 24-hour period, that's our target for our calcium chloride test. If it's there, that's telling us that, yeah, we're okay to go ahead and install. But what that's telling you is how much moisture is actually coming out of the concrete. That's different than actually knowing the quantity of moisture that's in the concrete, because that's, oh, where does, where does that moisture come from? It just comes from the surface of the concrete. So that's all you're really testing. Once you cover the concrete, it's no longer able to breathe. The moisture from the bottom of the concrete is now going to rise to the top. So it, it equilibrates throughout that concrete slab. When that happens, it picks up the moisture content, so you can get a, a problem just relying on that calcium chloride test. Sometimes that's the only test we can perform, but you know, it's not, it, and, and it, we have a long history of using that test but it's not giving us enough information to know what's gonna happen after we install. The best test for that would be a RH test, as you mentioned earlier, a relative humidity test. And what that is, is you target the 40% down into the, into the slab and measure the relative humidity at that point. If it reaches 75%, that's where the target that we're trying to hit. If it's higher than that, there's a good chance that it's too wet for us to install or we need to apply a moisture mitigation product that doesn't allow that moisture to affect our flooring. So those, that's, a, that's the biggest issue that we have to deal with when, with concrete. What's another one? Flatness. It's gotta be flat. If you have a lot of undula undulation in that concrete floor, quite often you'll end up with hollow spots or you'll have movement in the floor which can cause squeaks. Either way, that's a repair. And if you have to repair a subfloor, how do you repair the subfloor after installation? <laughs> yeah, you have to remove the floor to get to the subfloor. So that's, it becomes a very expensive repair. So it's very critical that we have a flat surface to start with. And those of you that are, con uh, that are contractors in here, what happens when you bring your straight edge out, start measuring up how flat that surface is, and then tell the customer that we've got to flatten out their subfloor, and this is what it's going to cost. There isn't very many homeowners that when, once they get hit with that bill that, that want to pay what it costs to actually do the job properly. So what do we do as, con we, 
This is a trap that a lot of contractors fall into. Well, we can't make it perfectly flat, but I'll get it pretty close, and it'll save you some money. This is what we do, right? We try to solve problems. That's what we're here to do. So I'm gonna get, cut you a break on the leveling. I'm, doing, I'm just gonna do a little bit of it, but really what you're doing is setting yourself up for a failure. Because you might be doing them a favor up front, but later on if you come back and you still have movement in the floor or you still have hollow spots, is the homeowner gonna be happy? Are they gonna want you to fix it after the fact? When you could have prevented that by actually saying, no, this is the tolerances that we need to have, and typically for our engineered, it's 3 16 over 10 foot span. That's how much it can rise or fall. And that's stated in our wood installation guidelines. And most manufacturers adhere to those, to that standard. That's your target, and you have to explain that to your customer. This is, this is what we're, that our target is. And if we don't do that, and there's a failure down the road, you're gonna give me a call and want me to fix it. And it's gonna be harder to fix then than to eliminate the issue altogether. So yes, it's expensive to do a proper job, but a proper job is necessary because you can't fix the subfloor after it's been installed or you have to remove what you've installed. So deal with it right away and deal with it properly. What's another issue with concrete? We have flatness, we have moisture. CSP or concrete surface profile is another thing that we really need to concern ourselves with. So what does that mean? We're talking about the porosity of, of concrete. If you're gonna use an adhesive to, to glue down a floor, you need to make sure that the adhesive has a chance to penetrate into the concrete or have something, to, a tooth to bite into in order for it to stay there. And if you don't have that, you'll get an issue like I have under my arm here, where this has been glued down to concrete. You'll see that there was a spot there where it was porous enough to adhere to, but the rest of it is pretty slick. So, they thought this was gonna work, but they didn't have enough porosity in that, in that concrete to, for the adhesive that they used, so it just peeled right off. I'm gonna pass that around so you can see what that looks like. So most manufacturers, will uh, adhesive manufacturers, will stipulate what CSP or concrete surface profile is required for their adhesive to work. Typically, it's going to be around a, a, a three, like you have here, or a two. Rougher concrete is better, especially for the adhesive manufacturer, because they get to sell a lot more glue the rougher the concrete is, right? But um, typically, it's going to be around a three. Now, what you'll notice quite often with self-leveling underlayments, they seem to be pretty slick. But they are formulated to have the porosity required for the adhesive to stick to it. The rule of thumb for that is, Whatever uh, self-leveling compound you, you decide to use, it has to be compatible with the adhesive. So you have to make sure that dealing with the manufacturers that does this work over your product or is it not gonna work? Because you'll see a lot of self-leveling underlayments that are very slick. They might not be compatible with all the adhesive. So you gotta make sure that whatever self-leveling compound you're using is compatible so you have enough porosity for the adhesive to stick. It's a common error that happens out in the field. All right, so we've dealt with some of the, the manufacturing issues that you'll get with engineered flooring. We've dealt with some of the environmental issues that we come across at post installation. Um, the most important thing for us as contractors is how do we prevent these things from happening? When you're racking out, make sure you give a good examination of the board so they don't have pre-existing checks and splits or, or shake in it to start with. And another thing is moisture testing, flatness testing, and the porosity. Now, moisture testing. How many of you guys own moisture meters? Excellent. That's, that's good news. There's most of you in the crowd. Now, I'll tell you, if I were to ask that same question 10 years ago, you'd see very few people put their hands up. But the reason you see so many now is because there have been a numerous occasions where floors have failed because of that. What's the most important thing to do when you're doing your moisture testing. The most important thing to do is to document what those results are. If it's good for you at the time of installation to know what everything is, if it's good to go or not good to go, but should there be a change later on and a failure occurs 
and an inspector gets called in to inspect or look at that failure and determine the cause of it. If you don't have documentation for the, for the moisture testing that you did, the inspector doesn't have a whole lot to go on. So if he doesn't know what the conditions were at the beginning, but he can see the failure at the end, you haven't done enough to, to clear your name prior to that inspection. So it's really difficult, it makes it difficult for the inspector. I've been an inspector for a lot of years, and when I see people give me documentation on the moisture testing they did, I'm as happy as I can be because Believe it or not, inspectors aren't out to get you. It's easy to hang you up for it if you haven't done your due diligence. But we're, that's, not, that's not the rule of an inspector. So what's the easy way to document your, your moisture testing? Exactly right. So the comment was, you're going to write it down. If you write it down on the subfloor, that's a great place to do it. Just write it down on the subfloor, take your phone out, and take a photo of your, that you've got it documented on your phone. You could email that back to yourself and then stick that in the file with the rest of the job. At least you have your documentation. If you're gonna do the testing, you at least need to be able to prove that you did the testing. So it, documentation is every bit as important as actually taking the tests. So moisture meters, what kind of moisture meters are we using? There's a, there's a few different varieties. And I would suggest that you own all of them because they are good for different reasons. So if we're dealing with engineered, how effective is a topical meter to determine moisture content? It gives you a qualitative measurement, but it's not going to give you a quantitative measurement. In other words, if I'm using this as an initial test to see if something is out of whack or if I have really dry material and really wet material for some reason, then this will, will work for you for that instance. But we, this will not determine what the moisture content is in engineered. And the reason for that is that all these meters are species specific. So in other words, you've got to plug in what kind of material you're testing. If it's oak, you've got to, you've got to correct it to oak before you do your testing. If it's maple, you've got to switch it to maple because they all have different specific uh, gravities. So now when you have a piece of, of engineered material, the top might be hickory or maple or oak, but the core is not. So you don't have a species setting that will determine what the moisture content is of multiple species. So for this, it, it could give you a, a qualitative measurement, but it's not gonna give you what the moisture content is of the material. So for an engineered product, if you wanna know what the face ply is, the best, meter to use is one that has really short pins. Because this will only determine what the moisture content is of the wear layer. And is, that gives us an accurate measurement of what's going on on top. That's important for us to know. But the initial thing that we want to see when we start removing engineered product from the boxes, does it come out of the box bowed like this or skied up like this? Or is it flat like this? If it's bowed or skied, what's it telling you? It's telling there's a moisture imbalance within the product itself. There's enough expansion going across in this direction that's causing the floor to bow up. So when you start removing it from the, from the box, if that's, that's a, a telltale that there could be a moisture imbalance in this product. So again, we need to phone the manufacturer, try to find out if this is the way it's supposed to be or not. And I'll get, I'm going to tell you a bit of a horror story in that I did do an inspection where that came to light through the claim history and that they said, well, no, it was, all, it was wide plank, long length hickory. It was all coming out of the bundles, all bowed out, but they tried to force it in. It was getting too difficult for them to continue installing. So they sent that material back to the manufacturer. And the manufacturer, to remedy the situation, started putting more relief cuts in the back so the floor would sit flatter and they, it would be easier to install. And they sent it back to the site. The reason I went for that inspection, why do you think I went back for that inspection? Because it all blew up. There was a moisture imbalance. They didn't treat the moisture imbalance. They just made the, the product easier to install. So by not eliminating the, the moisture issue in the first place, the manufacturer was on the hook for the entire floor because of what they did. They didn't treat the problem, they treated the symptom. 
and the floor blew up after that post installation. So if you see something like that, you have to let the manufacturer know that, that there's, a, there's a potential issue there. They need to know about that because it's not just your floor that that's being installed with that product. Somebody else's is, as well. So uh, for engineered product, it's good to have a, a pin meter that's got short pins so you can at least know what the wear surface is. That's the most accurate because we don't know what the core is made of. They might say Baltic birch, but it might, might not all be Baltic birch. There could be other species that are mixed in with it as well. So it's really hard for this to determine from multiple species what the moisture content is. Surface temperature, do you guys install over radiant heat? I, in my area, there's a lot of it. I live up in Vancouver, Canada. We do a lot of radiant heat there. Very important to know what that surface temperature is going to be because the flooring is becoming the heating element for the entire room. And plumbers don't care what the floor covering is going to be. When they put their tubing in, they just want the tubing in as easy as possible so they can get it done and out of there as fast as they can. They don't care what's going on top. The problem that we have quite often with uh, hydronic radiant heat is that it's the spacing between the tubes. Typically, they'll go to a foot because that's all they require to heat the concrete. But the farther apart you go, the hotter the tubes have to be in order to heat that space, and quite often that makes it too hot for us to install. So in radiant heat situations, with your customers, it's very important to ask them if, if they plan on heating the house. Is this your primary source of heat, or are you just warming the floors? Because that's going to limit what you could put on top in terms of flooring. It, just because it's engineered doesn't mean that it's going to be suitable for that, that situation. So you have to curb the expectation there a little bit. How many of you own a hygrometer? Very good. Are you an inspector? <laughs> That's why you got all the toys. So a hygrometer is actually works in concert with your moisture meters. Because how do you know what, what your moisture content needs to be of your flooring unless you know what the environment's going to be in the room? You need to know the temperature and what the relative humidity is going to be when it's in use, because that's going to tell you the target of moisture content that you're going to have to reach. So they work hand in hand. Without one of these, you, you, it's good to take the moisture tests, but really what you need to find out is what the target is that I'm trying to reach with my moisture content. And the only way to do that is with the use of an, a, a hygrometer. Now you're only responsible, as a contractor, you're only responsible for the environment for the time that you're in the building. So if I'm installing in this room, if I'm coming back in a few days, those few days I'm there, I'm going to measure what the relative humidity and temperature are, and I'm going to document that each day I'm there. Because if I could prove that everything was fine while I was here, but something happened after the fact, it's not on me, it's on somebody else. Data loggers are a good thing to have as well. And what that is is just one of these that you leave on the site for the, for the time that you're there, and it'll print off the, the data from 15 minutes or hour to hour or, or whatever you set the, the data logger up to. So at least then you have documentation and proof that you controlled it for the time that you're there. You have no control after you leave. You can't come into the person's house and deal with their thermostat every day. So it's important, again, this is all part of your moisture testing. So a hygrometer is something that you need to carry as well. Um, have we got any questions? I don't know if there's anything else I need to cover. Anybody? Look at that, I'm on TV. Yes? Okay. Very good. So there is a question. Um, if you're looking at concrete, such as the concrete that we have in front of us, how do you know if it's got the correct porosity or not? So a good, a good initial test is to drop water on it. If you drop water on it and it beads up, there's a good chance that it's either really slicked out so that it takes a long time for the water to absorb, or there's a sealer on top. Now, we don't know what kind of sealer is on top, and we're not going to know if it's going to be compatible with the adhesive that we're going to use. So quite often, if you come across that and, and the water beads up, you'll probably have to do some uh, additional grinding to remove all of the sealer that's on top or rough up that surface, or bead blasting, shot blasting. You could do that to get a, a, a more porous surface to, to, to adhere to. It's a good question. Anything else? 
here's another issue that, uh, that often comes up that I haven't touched on. Um, quite often, manufacturers will allow um, contractors to glue it down, float it, and nail it. There are some issues when it comes to nailing down engineered products. So it's very important that you read the installation instructions to understand what gauge of nail is required or if, it's, if a staple is required, and the spacing. So again, if you, uh, they will stipulate how far off the ends the, the fasteners have to be, and they also stipulate how much space there is in between fasteners in order for this to stay flat. Now what, we, what we're dealing with a lot nowadays is we're getting into wider and wider widths for our planks. So again, if, I'm, if I put a fastener in here, but I got a much wider board that I'm fastening, it's responsible for a lot to hold down a lot of material. And quite often, it's just not enough. So a, a real hot button topic these days, now that we're going with wider and wider planks, is to assist the nailing with, with adhesive. And there's two ways of doing that. Well, there's a lot of ways to do that, but um, there's glue assist. So in other words, the fastener is the main fastening tool that you're using, or the, the staples or, or cleats or whatever you're, you're using is the main fastener, but you assist it with adhesive as well so it doesn't get that movement. Another way is nail assist, where you would full trowel spread the glue and use less nails, but just use it to pull the boards in place to keep it from moving while during installation. Both are acceptable methods for the most part, um, but it, you have to be very um, you have to understand what it is you're doing when you're, in, uh, when you're putting glue with the nails. If you have a wide plank like this, and when you're applying your adhesive, quite often people will like to use a, a glue gun or uh, sausage tubes, and what they'll do is they'll draw out a, a, serpentine, um, a serpentine ribbon of, of adhesive, but they'll have a really large nozzle, so they'll be applying a really large bead and they'll do that and then they put the board in and they start nailing it up. Now if you don't go with the adhesive from edge to edge, if you concentrate that adhesive in the center and you nail into the tongue, what will often happen is that adhesive that's right down the center acts as a fulcrum. So as you, when, you, when you put the nail in here, it lifts the back end of the board up. So unless the board is sitting on a flat plane, when you step on that board, it'll rock. And when you get independent movement of boards, what do you end up with? Squeaky floor. The reason we're putting that adhesive in there is to try to prevent the squeaking. But quite often, if it's not done correctly, it'll actually cause the squeaking to happen. So it's important that if you're going to use adhesive, that the entire board is embedded in that adhesive so it stays flat. It's a common mistake. Um, any other questions? Nope. Well, I thank you. All. Oh, did you have one, Ralph? Okay, good. Because he's really going to stump me. I know it. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, guys, for coming. And if you haven't come by the booth, please do. Love to talk to you some more about anything that you have concerning wood flooring. Thank you very much. <laughs>